and the uh, brand center. How many of you have not filled up the positive? How many of you this is the first time? <laughs> wow. All right. Well, we're going to use some more opportunities for that. I kind of done here. Uh, but we're really glad. We wanted to do the Sam Summit for a few years now. And we wanted to bring you guys up to date on a lot of the science and some new things for you to learn. A lot of speakers and other here this weekend that you did not see any of your uh, inaugural training program, <coughs> rest control. Give you guys a chance to uh, meet each other because really there's no other than your initial training. You guys never get together. So uh, that's cool. And we also saw celebrate the success of the program. So um, glad you can make it. Uh, you know, when you guys do your evaluations, it'll really be helpful for you to let us know what you liked, what you didn't like. If you come back, if you came back, what you'd like to see different next time. Um, what time of year might be better? Uh, Tracy and I are kicking around with to do this like every other year, every two years. I am. It's a very good year. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, so welcome. So my name is Kevin Curley. I am an Education Services Manager for the Department of Natural Resources. And uh, Tracy Page, of course, to my left, is, is the Salmon Fashion Coordinator. So for the first 45 minutes-ish, we're going to kind of give you an overview of the program, its history, um, where it is today, and a few other things from about 30,000 feet from the DNR that we, we really want all of you to know. So we're going to get started um, here with a little video. So if you work this backwards, uh, I want to give you just a few slides on, on the history of the salmon again in Michigan. You guys all know this story. Sure. But I just want to give you a quick update. When you think about uh, some of the speakers we've got lined up today, so don't ask me any questions. I'm just the overview. We've got 30,000 feet kind of guys. We have uh, the Lamprey Queen coming in later on this weekend. Uh, Randy uh, Claremont, our, our, our fisheries biologist, is all about salmon in the Great Lakes. Uh, Greg's here from Idaho, he's saying about Pacific salmon, which of course is the origin, origin, origin of the salmon that you have. And a lot of other speakers in here, um, it's, it's really going to be a cool weekend. So I'm not going to labor the history, which is probably something you labor at your original training with John, um, but just a few slides to get us started. But we wouldn't be here doing salmon in a classroom if we did not have, which is a little brainer, right? If we did not have salmon in the Great Lakes. If we did not have salmon in the Great Lakes if it weren't for the, the crash of the lake trout. And we would not have had the crash of the lake trout. If we're not for our friend here. Uh oh. Let's see. Let's Video. 
so glad I didn't put a video on there. So anyway, the last we get into the Great Lakes, as you know, and um, by the Civil War, they were already in Lake Ontario, which is amazing to think about. So uh, and then they, they did a the little thing and got around the rest of the Great Lakes. They began to feed on the lake trout, which was their favorite um, prey. And of course, that was the top of the food chain in the Great Lakes. Um, you can see this um, map here. So this is lake trout just in Lake Superior, how great the numbers were. And then let, right here in the late 40s and 50s, that's the crash of their population as the land grade who wandered in here in the late 30s really began to colonize Lake Superior and would just have a happy day uh, while there was no trout. So uh, it's a great graph to show you too, really explain it well. And then they began to use um, this TFM, dry floral methyl. Got it. Trichloromethyl nitro something, phenyl nitro or something. Um, but they targeted 6,000 different chemicals to try to find the perfect lampicide. And so TFM won the prize. Um, and then this is how they, uh, you know, they administer the TFM streams. So they kill the little squiggers when they're you know, in the sand to like the green bean. Uh, and that's how they take them out. But it was over 90% effective in, in wiping out sea lamp rate. So that was the first step to really help restore the Great Lakes from the sea lamp rate. And then, of course, uh, the Department of Conservation, which we were known then, decided, uh, well, we probably should do something else to bring in another species, because there wasn't a lot of consensus that lake trout <coughs> populations would rebound for a long, long, long time, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 years. So they thought we needed a, a quicker fix for the Great Lakes to help balancing. So, you know, a lot of literature is review and all that stuff scientists do. And then began to get on the phone and talk to biologists in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, so that's what they did. Um, so they uh, turned to the, the Pacific Northwest with a lot of, uh, obviously, native salmon. They brought coho salmon in uh, 1964, a million coho eggs. We raised them in a hatchery for about a year, and then we released them uh, at the Platte and the Manistee here, and also at Big, uh, Big Huron River up by Berga. And about a year, year and a half went by, and all of a sudden, um, huge, monstrous, hundreds of thousands of fish, all staging at the mouths of the river where they were released, getting the same rivers, and uh, huge fish. So the Department of Conservation quickly got a season going, so it was a revolt. And, uh, you know, people were out there, they say hotel rooms were closed in 60, 60, 70 miles in the direction full of people that were catching 15, 18 pound um, salmon. So uh, it was a huge, a huge story. And then a few years later, they went and brought Chin uh, Chinook out. So first it was Coho, and then they brought Chinook eggs out from the state of Washington, uh, which were even bigger salmon, and they required a less return on investment, time in the hatchery. So actually cheaper for us to raise the time. And so a couple of weeks up, and you'll hear from Randy a little bit later um, from there to present time of how things are going now. But so that's kind of the introductory story. So the cool thing about the Chinook, which is a great civic lesson for your students, is so here's this fish that quote unquote saved the Great Lakes, and back in its native waters uh, in the Pacific Northwest is a danger. Good story. And uh, Greg is going to talk a little bit about that later when we have our sound for the references. So, um, <laughs> so the standard was great in Michigan in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. I mean, a couple of down bubbles, but um, in, in all in all, the salmon fisheries were really good in our state. And this fisheries biologist by the name of Tom Rosich, who just passed away this last year, by the way, I'll um, give a little tribute to him in the uh, your salmon sensitive well, I wouldn't even remember. But uh, Tom got this crazy idea of giving a handful of schools some salmon eggs, just saying, here, this is what you do No permits, no paperwork, no, no training. Here they are. See what happens. So he did that. In, uh, so I went back and researched my archives. 1993 was the year that he claimed that the meeting on his dad did that. <laughs> so for the first few years, yeah, it was all kind of, you know, here's some eggs. Darkness, all that, and um, 
but schools began to ask about it. You know how you teach that, right? <laughs> and free. So slowly the program began to grow. I put Bill's name up there because I think Bill from our record, that was your first year. That's not right. Well, Bill is the longest standing, still living, <laughs> <laughs> executive year of all these qualifiers. Family class and teacher. So the program begins to grow. Never, we've never marketed this program really ever. I mean, we uh, we go to website about them, but we've never done a big hollow balloon because it just started growing on its own. So 2005, 32, you know, 2006, 67. Ooh. Well, that's where the problem starts, right? So at the time, all this was in our fisheries division. So if you know anything about government. You know, everybody has a little fight done in the government. So our fisheries division is another whole part of the DNR than tracing IR and marketing outreach division of the education. And we had a couple of people in our hatcheries that um, were involved uh, a little bit, but pretty much this was a fisheries division program in these early years. So the year it goes from 32 to 67, not a good thing, like uh, panic in the streets, right? Uh, all kinds of uh, nasty stuff going on. So we began having meetings. This looks like our fisheries division. I said a lot better dress. Um, and there was, they were pretty contentious from the notes I read and, and some of the sort of stories I heard. And there were people who wanted to, A, just tap the program, bam, right there, no more than 70 schools. And there were people who said, no, let's just kill this program. It's just out of hand. We don't have, we don't have any staff, we have money, and that stuff. And then a lot of people lay a little weight in their, on their opinions, right? So then everybody has to get involved. So it became a pretty contentious issue because the teachers that were involved thought it was very popular. Most of the department employees that were involved in fisheries and a handful of us in education thought it was a But it was, it was that pretty good. So now I'm going to take a step back in time. Uh, 2002, I was working here at Michigan United Conservation Club. So I'm building my vibe and I'm sneaking. Uh, and I moved to Idaho. Um, uh, to take over jobs as a conservation education supervisor for Idaho Fish and Game Department. Um, so, when I got, what did I know about Sam when I got to Idaho? Nothing. I knew Bear liked Edom. Uh, I knew that I liked Edom. I knew people like Cash. But that was, that was it. Uh, so, I get to Idaho and I find out that they are a deity in the state of Idaho. All people are talking about the Sam and Sam and Sam and Sam and Sam. A really bad analogy would be, I'll use it anyway. Do. You know, in Michigan, if you go up north for the last three months, you sit down at a tavern and somebody sits down next to you, what's your first question? Did you get your gear yet? Right? It's all about gear in Michigan. Um, if, you're a, if you're a sportsman or sportswoman. Uh, I, I know it's all about that. You know, how you how's your, how's your fishing last week? I mean, it's, all, it's all people talking about. So um, I had to get the speed, speed pretty quickly on, on salmon. So I learned about salmon. Uh, I don't have a. Uh, <coughs> Trout in the classroom, not a sand classroom program. I got to speak on that. I got just a little bit of knowledge of dangers. I had another video, but we'll come back to that later. Like, and that goes part of the video. We'll get back to this one. So um, I'm in Idaho about four and a half, five years, and I, I moved back to Michigan to take this job I have now. And I oh, want to go one, one step back. So I meet, we start meeting with all these people I showed you in those previous slides because it was, a, again, a contentious issue in 2006. When the program had doubled. You can also remember this 2006 was about when we were working our way into that recession thing. So there was a huge panic about budget. And no one was paying for any of this. Right? Everything was coming out of somebody's pocket, but nobody gets planned for it. So it had just doubled. Or it would double the next year. Or it the next year. So there was a, a lot of a lot of discussion. And uh, I'd only been back. To the state, probably four months, five months, and my new boss sent me a memo uh, via email. She said, You might want to look into this if you know anything about fish. Well, yeah, limited here, right? But it's an item. I felt prepared. So I, I sent some emails out and, and kind of got a temperature. And again, this is all in the fish division running this thing. And yeah, there was some there was some stuff about people saying, Yeah, there's a there's a movement among a couple of people that we shouldn't even be doing this, there's no money for it, we should just cancel the program. And I knew again from um, the, the trial of the classroom in Idaho and some other states I talked to about with it, it was gonna be a cool program. 
So I talked to a few of our education staff at the time, and we set up a meeting with our fisheries division, you know, across that drug room. And um, so let's figure out if there's any way we can work before anybody goes crazy here. And um, so we let fisheries division tell us all the problems they have, which is basically staffing. Um, you know, the fish biologists or production people are busy all the time, and you know how teachers can be. They get on the phone, you know, I talk for 10 minutes. <laughs> So they began to get concerned about the time it would take from an administrative point. Uh, they knew nothing, you know, many of the fishers in there got training in it. But, you know, education is not their strong suit, right? They're scientists, they're at the top PhD level. Like so um, they didn't feel, feel comfortable with teachers, if you can imagine that. Uh, so, we get, so every time they came up with an argument, we kept saying, well, what if we did that? What if we did that? What if we did that? Out of our our little uh, world, uh, marketing outreach. And they began to run out of excuses after a while. Uh, of course, I didn't tell my boss yet that we agreed on it. But uh, we eventually got there. And uh, so I said, well, let's do some more research. You know, we'll do our we'll do our job. So this is what we did. We got back and we called all these states um, and had like an hour interview with the coordinators of this program. Some raised salmon, some raised trout, some did both. Some states like California have 2,000 schools. I mean, they're huge. I think Washington had an 800 on top of this. This is 15 years ago now. It's 15. Um, but they all had different sizes of programs. And again, some raised trout, some raised sand, some raised both. Um, and I asked them a million questions. I was like, gosh, how many people run this program? What fish do you run? What's, you know, what's your time? You spend out in the year. You have to do a for training. You know, you know, all this stuff. And so uh, it was really good because we gathered a lot of information for our argument. And we learned a lot about what to do and what not to do from all these other states. And the two things that resonate the most with me are these two things. Um, the number one thing was do not ever go down the road we did and buy equipment for the school. You will go broke. And then you, you told me that you guys do in Idaho, right? Okay. Um, because when there's a budget crunch, and I remember reading a story in, the, uh, in one of our aquatic meetings about three years ago. The state of Washington like cut their program in half because they had no more money um, for this kind of program. So if you start buying all that and promise on equipment, and then you don't have the budget, you're in trouble. Plus, then you got to move it, right? So if you retire and sit in your school, someone's got to go get it and bring it back to work for the next one. So we took that, and we had up until then, Michigan had that, as you know. Uh, no. uh, Michigan's never had given you guys any equipment anyway, so we were on the right track there. But we weren't going to go down the road into all those conversations. And the other thing was, a couple of these had done teacher training. Most did not and said that was their biggest mistake. So that's why we instituted the, the mandatory teacher training. We went back to, to that group again, and we sat down and we came up with um, all these ideas and then we formatted the program. And as you know, we built the website. Uh, we designed curriculum, we came up with those um, kits which have changed over the years, but all that all that stuff you get to take back after training. Um, <coughs> streamline the permit system, I know it's entirely to believe, but um, totally overhauled the program and got all the fishing division on the same page with us and really made a pretty distinct uh, line. So there are the experts on the fish job. So I mean they they, they bring the eggs in right. They raise them and bring them down to the hatchery for us to disperse to you guys. And they they get out, they buy the food for us and give out the food. But then when it comes to any of the education components, the training, the website, they let us do all that. And it actually turned out to be an incredible relationship. We have probably get along with our fisheries division. Anybody else in here what we do? Um, we get a lot of fisheries division probably better than any of our other divisions, partly because of this relationship we forged um, over this program. And, and one more thing here. So, um, the other thing all those other states told me was just about every one of them had one, two, three, up to five full time people doing this program. We had zero. So, over the years, you probably have gotten to know the thing I want to do is Shana Ramsey, Natalie Elkins, I use it myself in the very beginning, but I delegated quickly. Um, Craig Kasmer has been involved. We had, we had a lot of people in our, in our agency involved. Heard Polly Ray's name, she was like <laughs> permitting for us. And so I made this graph for my boss to show her how badly we needed a person to do 
do that. <laughs> because this program can't get any bigger. It's fourfold bigger than it was when people were panicking about big of them. Um, and so these were kind of what people were doing. And if there's no name by it, he wasn't getting done, he wanted to get it done someday. So uh, I finally helped sell this diagram. My boss, this is why we need a full time position to do this program because it's just got too big and we're way beyond spread it out. Not only we put more stuff on people's plates, I was giving plates out to anybody that walked by me. What do you know about that? I got something to do. Uh, Got really good support from my boss. We had a retirement in our in our section. Um, took that money, changed it over uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, had 80 applicants, and Teresa was the only person uh, to be our product head supervisor. So I want to guess about 70 percent of her job is standing in the classroom, but she does a lot of other product head stuff as well. Um, but it's been really good. So she's your go-to first. I mean, we still talk to Shana and Natalie and everybody else who's Natalie this weekend. Um, and they all know what's going on, but she's go-to human. Um, now, okay. So that's your turn now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so because of all that, I call it because you like it. <laughs> but, so, um, accidentally, I have circled around the salmon multiple times in my life and career, so that's me on uh, Lake Terrible and on Tiny Abbey. But, um, but yeah, so I grew up in Michigan. I went to U of M, transferred to the University of Hawaii. They don't have salmon yet. Um, I got a dual degree in marine science, which is marine biology and oceanography. And then I came back to MSU for grad school. So I have a weird degree that, like, 20 of us have at Zoo and Aquarium Management and Non-Formal Education. And then I popped around with zoos and aquariums, oddly enough. So I uh, worked at Potter Park Zoo. If anybody's ever been there back in the day with the coral reef incident, that was my master's thesis. I literally slept in that room. Um, so that was back in the day. Back there. That's her classroom now. If anybody goes and visits them now. Uh, but then I went to the Alaska Sea Life Center. I was an educator there. They do have seen um, back to my part, and then I went to the South Carolina Aquarium in Charleston, and I was an educator there as well. Um, and then I ended up back in Michigan. So I ran a nature center for about 10 years, and just because of my background, I kind of did as much aquatic stuff as I could, especially being on a river, so that helped. Um, but in the midst of all of this, I heard about this Academy of Natural Resources program my very first year back to Michigan and came. So the first year I was at a student right i participated the second year i think i was a student four days and taught one day then the next year i taught two or three days and faked like i was a student the other day and then after that he's like you're just teaching so um i have been to every a and r except the first a and r north that i was playing with it. um but yeah so i got involved with all the dnr projects a long time ago but from a sideways angle so when i got my job i kind of knew what was going on because i had done it all it helped with a million salmon movies as a resource person from an acre center. So I kind of came in sideways the whole time. But so when I answer your questions, I do sort of know what's going on. <laughs> uh, okay, so I can jump into the what's happening now, right? So we currently have right about 270 teachers, um, depending on drops and requirements and you know, all that good stuff. Uh, our goal now is to add about 25 new teachers per year. We also get a handful of returning teachers, um, so people that took a year off for whatever reason. Um, we have replacement teachers, so when a teacher retires or shifts schools or grade levels, usually somebody else will pick up the tank and uh, run with it. So this year we have about 45 teachers attend our new teacher workshops, which is a pretty normal number. And we're going to try to stick to that pattern over the next several years. Um, the, totally artificial arbitrary cap to the program is 500 at this point but that's just a total random number that got thrown out in the wind so but very good growth you can see there's you know a couple walls um usually tied to money right so if districts are flush and they're happy to throw money around or grants um those types of entities are happy to throw money around and get a little bit of a boost some years not so much so uh, but very good growth. And again, this is where having one person that can collect all the pieces and, and cohesive messaging helps. 
this is another thing that's changed a lot. So in the beginning, it was very heavy in elementary, and then Bill out in the wind with older kids. Um, we are pretty well split. And I like how it rounded. Holly was just drafting them with a uh, <laughs> uh, So we are very well split now. So now I'm trying to catch us up. So if you look through the original curriculum, it's very elementary heavy. So I worked last year and then again this winter. I'm trying to keep up for the higher grade levels, all of our lessons and activities, to follow the trend we've been following. So this, we don't select teachers based on grade level. It's um, applications are scored on a rubric, and that really has nothing to do with it. So this is on accident. This is a percentage of good applicants. Um, this happens to trickle out to a third teacher. So very cool statistics as we, as we grow the program to know that we're getting all the grade levels as well equal. Um, and some people cover all of the above, right? So we're going to add that category in the future as we overhaul our database this year. So sometimes you'll ask questions and I'm like, uh, I sort of know the answer to that. We're in the middle of completely redoing our database that includes all the sponsor information. So at the end of the year this year, it'll be like, who is your sponsor over here? We'd like to thank them, but we just really want a good list. Um, those types of bits of data have been lost over the years, so we're trying to get back on good footing and, um, and then cater to exactly who we have, so the teachers we have and the types of schools we have. Uh, and then this is the one you guys would like to know, right? Uh, why did it drop down in 2017? That was the 150 egg tester year. Um, so prior to that, it was 200 eggs, but again, fewer teachers. And then in 2017, because of the salmon run, they dropped it to 150 um, as a tester. Last year, it went back into 200. Part of um, me coming on was to put together a committee. So there was, had kind of been one a long time ago, and then it fell by the wayside. So we have a sampling classroom committee made up of marketing and outreach, so educator people, and then fisheries division um, people are involved. And that's helping guide our decisions for the future. And one of those was to switch back to the 150. Now, I talked to a couple people last night about why, do you remember? What was the justification? Yeah. So change size is one. So in polling teachers, um, many of the teachers have 55 pounds. And just at the end of the year, that's too much fish for that little tank. And then you're chasing water quality issues, and then you're freaking out, and they're having panic, right? So to kind of abate that a bit, drop the number of fish down. So that's one part of the answer. The other part is, if you have larger than a 55 pound tank, you're going to have half your bigger fish. So it's a win-win. You're going to be putting better fish out into the system, and then the people that have the smaller tanks are not going to be hitting panic mode um, in March and April. So. Um, that was kind of the opinion of fishery staff, plus it's a more sustainable number for fishers, right? They know exactly what our number is going to be going forward, they can budget for that. Um, one of our speakers at our workshops actually slipped. So this is always, it's not a stocking program. This is not a stocking program. This is an education program. We accidentally stock some fish. Um, and he let it slip that, I think it was last year, we were 10% of the stocking. <laughs> but you always say that we're not. You know, <laughs> um, but, but that being said, so they dropped the quota of what they're stocking in recent years because of the food availability, right? The alewives have gone down, so you can't throw salmon out there with nothing to eat. So you have to drop your salmon down and find the balance. Um, so dropping us down helps with that giant equation because we are a big portion of that now. So it's all kind of a, an equilibrium thing. And we need to chase that as well as fisheries division. So that's really one. Uh, but that means from here on forward, and again, my, my graphs from this year on are beautiful and consistent and like magic. So I like that. <laughs> That's my brain. Um, so we have lots of good details that we've worked on over the years. And uh, part of it is changing to that 150 number. So any questions on all of that history stuff? A lot of information all along. Um, so to go along with the history, for those of you that haven't been in a workshop in recent years, that's another thing. So in this room, a third of you are pretty darn new. A third are the five, six year mark, and then a third are our old timers. So it's, and I don't mean I mean that in a loving way. <laughs> but um, you have seasoned veterans. Because uh, Kevin, how long are you? Uh, I would say three. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. Nice. Six. 
things that I did it myself, but then in college, I mean, I was not yeah. doing the chantry. Yeah, so we have a, 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 another size base one. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's a, that's a fun break out of this room. So definitely um, be sure to come and go and, and get ideas because everyone has a little bit of a different experience. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on so while I have you, I'll give you a couple updates and then we'll switch gears again. Um, so did everybody see the sketch signage out on the counter? Next to the coffee, there are sign-in sheets um, if you want those sketch hours. And sign in and out for breaks and all of that good stuff every day. And again, if you do it all at once, you just have to remember all day when you did things that's fine too. Um, but don't forget to do that. And definitely don't forget to put your pick number on there because otherwise I have to stalk you later. So um, definitely put the pick numbers down. You can always email them to me as well. So you have to go back and dig it out. Uh, did everyone find the freebie table? Who's table? Over there. There's goodies. So definitely um, take advantage of the goodies. I do not want to carry them home. Uh, resource table up in the other corner. So there are some different curriculum guides that would help you along your Santa the Classroom journey. So those are on the table. There's also a couple of nonfiction books that have come out in recent years. Um, King of Fish, I was talking to somebody about King of Fish last night. That's a good one um, that talks about the origin of our salmon. There's Light and Death of the Great Lakes, and then Howard Tanner, who is the guy that dumped that first batch of fish. Um, he just had a book come out a couple weeks ago. I think the first one's dropped. I, I just got my copy. I haven't even opened it yet. So it's brand new on the table. Um, but definitely take a look at those. Those are some that I will be using to create high school activities. So this winter, I'll be using those um, to create some lessons and, and bring in some new information. Uh, casting practice in the hallway, so if you need to burn off some energy, has anybody done back to bass? One? That's the thing. There we go. That's pathetic. Um, so by the bathrooms, you'll see a little chunk of PVC with a fishing line and a little plastic fish. And then some plastic fish on the floor out there that kind of look like flip-flops. That is casting practice. Um, so that is from Project Fish, Mark Stevens, who couldn't be here this weekend, but um, go out there, practice your casting. We can do demos, I'm sure Jonathan and Christine and I are in brand and probably can all uh, teach you how. Uh, but that's an easy care you can buy to use with your students. Um, you don't need big long poles that you have to store, no cooks involved. Um, but they can use bathroom baths. And it's from Project Fish. Um, but yeah, so that's in the hallway um, all day, so it will look great. Um, this afternoon, we are going to have a partner and expert panel. So some of our partners have to all sit at the table with each other back there. Um, Brandon Schroeder from Michigan Sea Grant, and then Rick Cruz and Steve Over from Cruz Press. They're going to be on the panel. Um, Kevin's going to be representing Mayo on the panel. But what I recommend is all those partners um, to bring at lunch and dinner, but not all of them are sitting around um, for the whole weekend. So uh, ask your questions of them over meals and breaks. Because that's when they'll be here. But they'll be on the panel kind of talking about what they do and how they help teachers um, with your SAM program. And then there'll be some kinds of questions, but definitely have something specific to catch them on race. And I know I talked to some people about this, but we um, had to adjust our schedule on the fly as of Thursday. Maybe guess why? Federal shutdown. So, um, yes, I redid the entire agenda on Thursday. But, um, all that does, as far as having you, is I forgot to put breakfast on the agenda this morning. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but all our meals are in the dining hall. Uh, breakfast is at 7.30 tomorrow morning, lunch is at 2, dinner is at 5.30 for that. Um, so we're going to be over there for all the meals. And then um, we shuffled a couple speakers, but this is a good thing. So it allowed us one thing, at the end of today, we are going to break up into breakable cohorts. And you can chat and talk and build relationships with people that teach the same stuff as you. Um, and then tomorrow morning, we have the opportunity to add um, a session from the text. So they'll talk to you about aquarium text and answer questions. So um, it took away a couple of cool speakers, but we uh, were able to shuffle in some other things that we just didn't have time for before. Um, and along those same notes, there's a lot of people in the room that stepped up to help with that. So um, they'll have this on the house and back hills and stuff. Christine, who I don't know if she our co-talk there. Um, she's the interpreter at Odin. She and Jonathan, who is our interpreter at Bay City, are now running the fish dissection tonight on like 
last second notice, like Christine went to the hatchery and got fish yesterday. So um, very cool stuff to help keep the experience rolling for you guys. The speakers that were scheduled are like 100% ready to confirm their um, attendance of the next summit. They don't care when it is. So they are ready to come and, and chat with you guys. As soon as they are allowed to open their computers, which is not going to shut down lower, um, they're going to send resources. So we have a flash drive of resources in your kit, but there also is a Google Drive. So on the back of your agenda that's in your folder, um, there is a tiny URL for a Google Drive folder. Um, that is half full right now, but I will be adding to it. So there will be another big lump of stuff that goes into it on Wednesday. And then as soon as the shutdown's over, a whole other group of stuff will go in there. So definitely go back and check that out right here because their presentations are amazing. So, um, any questions on the schedule? Did everybody find their agendas in their folders and all that good stuff? Okay. Um, and then in your bag, we have lots of goodies. So one thing, obviously, is the agenda. There are stickers. Definitely check in the folder pocket because there's a sticker in there, too. Um, if you need more of anything, there are some spares on the table that you can chat with me because I have some extra. So if you have a co-teacher or to let you teachers in your district or building and you need some spare materials, let me know. And I can get those for you guys. Yeah. OK. So here's the fun part. You ready? So, um, as I said, in front of our crowd, it's been with us a long time. So, Gail Miller, I'm going to come up here. I'm a present for you. So, Gail has been with us for 10 years. Jeremy Windsor back there. 12 years. Correct. I think it's 13. 13. Yeah. Yeah. I think I was one of those people that was at the beginning. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, our next one is John Gray. Sponsored. And then, uh oh, my first one ran away. 
Uh, Bruce is our big sponsor, so uh, Bruce Pets is uh, our, our pony sponsor. <laughs> That's where all your t-shirts came from and extra swag. So definitely thank Rick and Steve, um, and they'll be here all weekend hanging out, so we're very uh, grateful to them. And um, because they have all the smarts, so they know all the things. And they're going to show off some cool technology for our morning, so definitely um, keep them in mind as we go through the weekend. And that's back to you. Okay, so uh, I want to. Your battery is running low. On the clicker? No, I think on your on your computer. <laughs> okay, so um, I just want to since I have all these teachers here, I can't pass possibly pass up any so I, I do want to go add a few things here from about 30,000 feet um, about uh, the DNR and the program. Okay, so um, if you go back to when I talked about uh, this program in crisis, kind of sort of around 2006, and the budget was a huge concern, because none of this, none of this program was budgeted or anything, um, it made me think about how most people don't understand in our state budget, and nine out of ten people I talk to on the street or or anywhere else, if I were to say how is how are who's paying for natural resources, of course the common answer is my best, which of course is not could not be further from the truth. So I'll tell you that so you can pass that word as you go. So um, if you look at that top number, four hundred thirty-eight million dollars is our budget for our department. For this year. So, another thing, you know, when I ask a lot of people, so is that a lot of money or not? You know, a lot of people are asking a lot of money. Well, look at Ron James makes 35 million this year. Oh, okay. Well, maybe that's not a lot. The state of Michigan budget is $59 billion. <coughs> and our share of that is $438 million. So, if you were to do a pie chart, which I've been looking for, I don't have one because I uh, there is no ready made one I could find. I would have to spend about two days going through every agency budget to build one. But you were to take like um, Health and Human Services, it's like $25 billion budget. Uh, Department of Corrections is a $2 billion budget. Uh, State Police is a $700 million budget. So by the time you get down to DNR and DEQ, if you were to do a pie chart, like a pencil yeah, on the pie chart. And you can see that this general revenue number, 49 million, is or 11 percent of our entire budget is really the taxes, what we get from your taxes. So uh, this is again a lot of the slides. This is the um, federal dollars that come in. We get a lot of federal money. But the hugest chunk, hugest chunk, biggest chunk, is uh, called state restricted revenue, which is basically money we raise. So whether it's people who buy fishing licenses, camp. Um, we bought, I know everyone's got their sticker on the car, the new registration. You pay your $11 and you get your license registration. Um, timber sales, uh, mineral rights, and, and oil and gas revenue stuff. All that is how we generate the bond, the buy and large, the huge bulk of our money. Um, all this purpose. And then again, this is this is federal dollars. Then if you're familiar with Pittman Robinson, Nathan Johnson, the Coast Guard, you get free money from uh, a lot of federal groups like that. <laughs> a little, little sliver is uh, partnership grants, you know, Kellogg uh, grant or something with a bunch of other folks that we, we get money and we do things with as well. But that's that's a snapshot of our budget. So this is another one. This is not that same budget year, but it's the best breakdown I could find again to show you. So this is basically this chunk here, or 21%, is what we bring in from uh, basically high efficiency. Uh, this again is that federal dollars we get. So this is camping, park stickers, park park parks, uh, lumbering or timber sales, forestry. Where you get that general fund money again, your taxes. Parking dominant is uh, money off of, uh, again, 
general, uh, basically land trust fund. Um, so we get money from uh, oil and gas revenue, um, and then all these little millions. millions. And then this is basically, in turn, how we spend uh, the money we bring in. <coughs> Wildlife, we spend 10%, law gets 10%, uh, forestry gets 11%, so it's kind of broken up that way as well. But the moral of this whole story, because you're like, yeah, I don't remember. <coughs> um, whoops. This is, yeah, okay, I hope they didn't see this one. Yeah. All this stuff you see here is basically what you guys get for five bucks a piece. So we have $49 million in taxes. We're gonna we're gonna round that up to 50 million, just because it's an easy number. There's 10 million people who live in Michigan. So every man, woman, and child in this state contributes to their taxes five bucks for this agency. So a person like Bill's got two kids, right, Bill? So Bill's family of four contributes 20 bucks. Okay. Um and it's amazing when I talk to, to uh, a lot of groups out there. I always talk to this group of Oakland County leaders every year, the doctors and all these rising leaders in Oakland County, and they come up here for a conference. And they're like 70 or, and then, you, know, you know, they're all pretty high hit, heavy hitters. You know, they're CEOs, whatever, but they're young, coming up through the ranks, and, and then they kind of sort of came away. Um, and then when I hit with this, you should see how the jaws go. Because they just have assumed that all their natural resources, all this cool stuff out there is paid for by the tax. And, and so if you, you know, if you hunt, if you fish, if you camp, all those other things, you're also contributing to the department. But think of how many people in this state are paying five bucks a year for all these things. So that is a cool lesson. It's probably not a lesson you know, your report to everyone here, right? Um, but it's a lesson for you guys to you know. And, and it's going to be interesting because it's a challenge because our money's not getting any better, right? The hunting and fishing licenses, you know, as you know, most people are hiding and fishing numbers are going down over there every year, they have for a while. Um, camping numbers are actually going up. More people are spending time in the campgrounds. Um, but it's a challenge as we go forward. So keep that in mind. Um, and the other the other piece of this I, I want you to remember, this is some story you should be telling your kids. And that's just simply that these resources belong to them. Again, when I give a lot of talks in public. And I usually have my green DNR shirt on, little name tag. <clears throat> These guys dress right back over here. Maybe that's good. There you go. Um, you know, so we, we, when I'm usually doing that speech and I show all those wonderful pictures of resources <coughs> and I say to the crowd, so who do these resources belong to? And it doesn't matter whether they're a fourth grader or a 50 year old person, they usually point at me and go, you, you belong to you. You got government. No, no, no. They belong to you. But it's, it's something that, that we just take for granted. In America, because of the public trust doctrine, uh, and we did things differently than they did in Europe. Greg and I have been talking about this for a few days. We did Europe all the time. Um, it's just a different world. You know, back in the old days, the rich, the landowners, the kings, the queens, the barons, the emperors, they owned everything. Right? You were lucky to get access to any natural resource. In America, the common person had access and still does. Um, and that's important because a lot of people take it for granted and don't realize. So we are, uh, the department and all those employees that you see here in the department here, we are working for you to protect this, the resources for current and future generations. But they belong to you and your students. So make sure they understand that. That's important. Okay, just a couple quick commercials before we hand this off. Um, Sam in the classroom is a great program. You guys know all about it. I want to keep that up. We also have education centers all around the state. So the STARS are our full-time visitor centers. We met some people. We met Ed last night. And you guys are from Carl T. Right there. Right? Carl T. Uh, Christine's here from Odin. Is Craig coming? Yeah, still here tomorrow. Craig Kasner. We'll be here from Hartwood Pines tomorrow. So a lot of our interpreters and staff can come in to help out with this thing. We have these all around. We have 65,000 kids go to these visitor centers uh, for field trips during the school year. So if you're one of those people that takes your kids somewhere, consider that. All the black dots are our seasonal um, summer programs, so they would really affect you other than if you take your family to a park in the summer. These are the parks that have um, programs, interpretive programs. But this is a, kind of the foundation of being our um, programs. And like I said, they, we have 
you know, 500,000 people a year coming through our visitor center and a lot of education there. All of them now have C Lamprey in their in the visitor center. So, so Santa Classroom you're familiar with, a ton of our resources and, and time go to that, a ton of the dissertation that most of our staff is. Uh, and the third part of this triangle, which I would say you spend a lot of time on in, in DNR education is professional development. So um, we kind of three levels. So we have this introductory level where you'll see Tracy and I or Natalie or uh, any of these other folks at uh, conferences, right? So to the Mayo Conference, which we're going to talk about later. The science teachers come to get a room every year where they're all day long in the room giving talks. Um, and all other conferences. Tracy was at the National Aquatic Ed Conference giving a talk a year ago. I went to the Cleveland this year giving a talk in the Wyatt. So we're all over the place doing these short. Um, education is important. <coughs> if you do, you should, you should embrace it kind of thing. Uh oh. Yeah, so uh, there's another logo that goes up there. This project, uh, Project Wild. So, um, Project Wild, Project Learning to Review. Those are DNR. So, those are kind of upgraded. Those are the shorter teacher workshops, four hours. You get certified in those. Now, this comes up tomorrow. We have Project Wild one uh, tomorrow afternoon. Some of you signed up for that. And then we have our uh, total full body immersion program in the summer that is now, I think this will be our 12th year this year, um, for scattering natural resources. So if you like this place, because it's your first time here, you just dying from that. Um, and Tracy gave you her little testimonial. That's how she learned about all of our stuff. This is a program we do up here in July. Um, there's a brochure everybody's packet. It's a week long. There's three classes you can choose from. Um, you get a scholarship from uh, John Gray with, uh, with Safari Club International, and their chapter has given us sponsorship money for teachers for 10 years now. <laughs> this is the year with over $100,000 in sponsorship money. Um, so you get 100 bucks knocked off just by sending a, a thing that's online. Uh, you go to our website, and we have two locations. We have a location here at Davis Lake. In July, and then we do another one up in the Upper Peninsula at the Ford Center, part of Michigan Tech, in August. So, um, if you have any questions about these programs, again, we're, we're out on the uh, A couple more, two more things I'll tell you about. Uh, so, this is our um, our uh, newsletter. So, some of you probably already get it. If you go to the DNR website and scroll to the bottom, you'll see a spot in the bottom left hand corner that says "Sign Up for the Newsletter." So it's called the Essential Educator. You go in, you put your email in, you check the box, and you'll get this newsletter about, about every month. It's about um, summer, not so much. We'll slop in the summer, but usually around the first week of every month, you get it. It just tells you what's coming up, the best in development, if there's a new snake poster out or some activity or something you should know about. So it's an easy way to keep up on what's going on in the state, on environmental ed. And then uh, one thing I did not capture here is we created a, a, a website. So a lot of you probably go to the DNR website on occasion. We also have a My Nature Facebook page. Sorry, Facebook page. So we create a My Nature Facebook page, which is all kind of the general side of DNR. So it's, it's uh, a lot of education. It's um, pictures. It's video. So you don't want to follow that. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. There's something you can post on there. Okay. Look at that. Three minutes to spare. Three minutes to set up the presentation. So, all right. Five minute um, coffee, coffee break. break. And then we'll uh, kick it off with our next speaker.